grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from the Savior who shows us what love is all about, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The text for us to ponder on this Life Sunday comes from the 82nd Psalm, verses 3 and 4, which read, Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. This is the Word of God. Sometimes we as Christians fall into a dangerous trap called pride. Sometimes we look at all the terrible things that are going on in this world and we begin to feel good about ourselves because we're not doing all the same terrible things that so many other people are doing. I mean, we're not out there killing people. We're not out there aborting babies. We're not out there selling drugs to, to young children. No, we're much better than those sort of people. See, that's the thinking that we can so easily fall into. And it's an example of what I call self-pride. In effect, we become like the Pharisees praying out loud on the street corner. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers. Quite honestly, it's very common for Christians to fall into this sort of thinking and begin to base the good feelings they have about themselves on this comparison that they make with other people. We like to look at how bad everyone else is so that we can begin to feel good about ourselves. We like to look at how bad everyone else is so we don't have to face our own sinfulness in fact, and the fact that we're the ones just allowing these things to keep taking place. But today I think God would like to remind us that we're really not meant to compare ourselves to other people. We're meant to compare ourselves to His Son, Jesus Christ, the Lord. I mean, if we're going to compare ourselves with anyone, then it needs to be Jesus and His holiness and His perfection. And if we make that sort of comparison, well, then I know we'll come to the conclusion that maybe we're not so good after all. It may be true that we don't commit all those really horrible sins that other people are, but we still commit an awful lot of horrible sins ourselves. The truth is we all fall far, far short of the perfection and obedience demanded by God. And this shows up when we consider our text for this morning. For in this text, God calls us to that higher way of living. Our life is meant to be more than just not committing some gross sins. Our lives are to be filled with love and compassion as we reach out to help people like Jesus helped us. Our God says to us in this text then, defend the cause of the weak and fatherless, maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed, rescue the weak and needy, deliver them from the hands of the wicked. God says to us then, it's not just enough not to be a negative influence in the world, we actually need to be a positive influence in the world. It's just not enough to not hurt others ourselves, we're also to be there to protect other people who are being harmed by others. Luther, in his explanation to the fifth commandment in the large catechism, makes this point. Not only is a person guilty who does the harm to another, but also guilty is the person who can defend and save him so that no bodily harm or hurt can happen to him and yet does not do it. If you see someone innocently sentenced to death or in like distress and do not save him, although you know the ways and means to do so, you have killed him. Those are powerful words. You see, sin can take two forms. There are sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are when we go out and do something that obviously breaks one of God's commands to us. If we go out and commit adultery or gossip or tell a lie or take something that belongs to our neighbor, those are sins of commission. 
But sins of omission are when we fail to do the things God would have us do, the things God put us here to do. As the book of James says, therefore to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Sins of omission then could include allowing someone we know to be innocent to be put in jail. Sins of omission could include allowing someone to be beat up or murdered without us ever even attempting to help. Sins of omission could include not helping a neighbor in great need when we have the means to do so. Sins of omission could include not witnessing about Jesus Christ when God gives us the opportunity to do so. Perhaps the greatest example of the sin of omission was done by the majority of the people in the Lutheran church in Nazi Germany. I mean, they stood silently by as the Nazi government bit by bit established its program of killing off the handicapped and gypsies and Jews For a large part of the Lutheran church in Germany, they stood by and never once did anything to try and stop the Holocaust from happening. They stood by and never spoke a word of protest. They felt like as long as they personally weren't hurting someone, that was enough. Well, that's the sin of omission. And that, my friends, most certainly is a sin. You see, God wants us not just to avoid doing the evil ourselves, He wants us to live that higher calling. He calls us to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. He he calls on us to be his witnesses and his ambassadors. We are then meant to be mirror images of his son. And people are to see Jesus in our lives. And that means we protest wrongs. We protect the innocent and the helpless. And we give help to those who need our help, that we are capable of helping. When people look at our lives, the goal is for them to see Jesus in us. And I think it's important for us to remember this higher calling that we have received as God's people, especially as we approach the 47th anniversary of the Supreme Court's Roe v. Wade decision, which legalized abortion. My friends, over 61 million babies have been put to death in the United States in these last 47 years. That's just in our country. And it's interesting, worldwide, just last year, 2019, 42 million babies were put to death by abortion. Abortion, year after year, is the number one cause of death among human beings. And what have we Christians and Christian churches been doing in the last 47 years? Well, for the most part, nothing. I mean, we may raise up our hands now and send and say, oh, that's horrible. But that seems to be about all we do. You know, and we kind of say to ourselves, it is terrible, but I mean, what can I do about it? And we use that as an excuse to just let the Holocaust go on. Why do we do this? Well, I think it's because of fear. I'll tell you what, it's easier to do nothing than it is to do something. It's easier to keep quiet than it is to speak out. It's less risky to just let the world do what it wants rather than point out this is a sin and this is wrong and this is murder. It's easier to do nothing And just stay out of it. But all the while we stand back, more and more babies lose their lives. And when God sees this, you know what he's saying. Don't just stand there. Do something. He says in our text, defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hands of the wicked. God doesn't say just stand there doing nothing. He says get involved. He says in the scripture, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. He tells us that we have to be their voice. He says to us in the 24th Psalm, deliver those who are being taken away to death and those who are staggering to slaughter. Hold them back. If you say, see, we did not know this, does not he who consider it 
who weighs the heart and does not and does he not know who keeps your soul and will he not render to man according to his work and all these texts god says don't just stand there do something but, but maybe you're questioning this maybe you're wondering why in the world you should do something why should I get involved? Why, why me? Why should I speak up for others? I mean, that's not really my business now, is it? I'm not my brother's keeper after all. Why should I defend the unborn? And if you're asking questions like this, I want you to know there is an answer. It's because of what Jesus Christ did for you. I mean, Jesus' love for you, his compassion for you, led him to take action for you. He did something to help you. He did something to help us all. He didn't just look with pity upon us in our great need. He didn't just feel sorry for us. No, he did something to help. Now, the easiest thing that Christ could have done as he looked at us who were lost in our sin, cut off from God with only an eternity of punishment before us, the easiest thing that he could have done was to do nothing. After all, it wasn't his problem. He wasn't the guilty party. He really didn't concern his person in any way whatsoever. So he could have just shrugged off our predicament. My, that's a mess they've gotten themselves into. Oh, well, that's none of my business. He could have done that, but that's not what Jesus did. He didn't shrug off our great need as he looked at us and the mess we had gotten ourselves into by our sin. No, his compassion led him to action. And thus he came into our world and was born of the Virgin Mary and suffered under Pontius Pilate and was crucified dead and was buried. He was nailed to a cross because he was concerned about the mess we had made for ourselves. He went through all of it to save us from our sins, to pay for our sins, sins of omission and sins of commission. That's what the cross was all about. And then he rose from the dead on Easter morning so that we could have new life too. Abundant life, a life that would never end, life in his name. Christ didn't just look at the sad predicament we were in. No, he did something to help us. Even if that meant going to a cross. And now Jesus calls on us, all the people who have tasted his love and compassion, to imitate him. And to reach out in love to help the people in need around us. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? Jesus told a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he, and when he saw the man he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite when he came to the place and saw him passed by on the other side. What did they do? They did nothing. It wasn't their problem after all. Why should they help? That's the modern approach of the church. But Jesus didn't end the parable there. He goes on. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him there. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. The Samaritan then helped this stranger and even gave two days' wages so that this man could have his needs taken care of. He went out of his way to help. Why in the world would he do that? Because he was filled with the compassion of Jesus Christ. And that's the gift Christ wants to give to all of us. It's interesting, after Jesus told this parable, he asked his listeners, which of them, which of the three men in this story was a neighbor to the guy who was beaten and robbed? And they correctly answered that it was the man who showed mercy. Well, it was then that Jesus showed us his desires for our lives. For he said, go and do likewise. Jesus called on all who follow him to live compassionate lives 
in imitation of him. He called on us to help others. And that's even if it costs us something, even if it involves a certain level of personal sacrifice. That's what we're called and created to do. And quite honestly, as we stand at the foot of the cross, appreciating all that Christ did for us, that's what we want to do now too. For once we have tasted God's mercy for us in Christ Jesus, then we just want to show that same mercy to everyone around us. Once we've tasted Christ's compassionate love, once we understand what he was doing on the cross, that changes us so that we are filled with compassion for others. And we really want to help the people around us who need our help, whether they're young or old, black or white, born or unborn, we want to help. Christ changes us and makes us more and more like him. And you know, if we allow Christ to, to work that change in us so that more and more we're showing his love to the world, I'm going to tell you something. We will actually change the world. The world will change and be a better place to live as we allow the love of Christ to be expressed through our lives. And that's God's plan. And I want to tell you, now is the time that we really need to live out this plan. For our world just continues to fall further and further away from God's desires. And the only thing that can change that is you and me. Back in the late 1970s was when I first became part of the pro-life movement. I was uh, a youngster in college. And I'd been brought up in a Lutheran church, and I knew what was right, and I knew what was wrong, and I knew abortion was wrong. And, and I remember taking part in walks and demonstrations against abortion. But for the life of me back then, I never could have imagined that 40 years later, this would still be going on. That our country, a country with the right to life, as part of our founding documents, could continue this modern-day holocaust for all these years. We can't just let this keep going on, my friends. Not when we have the capability of changing things. How can we change things? What starts by letting politicians know that if they want your vote, then they need to be acting on behalf of the unborn. It continues by you getting personally involved with young women and young girls even who may find themselves in a difficult situation with an unplanned pregnancy. See, you're the one who can make the difference in their lives. As you not lecture them, but love them and offer help and guidance and support, you can make all the difference in the world. And you're the ones who can help at the pregnancy care centers in our area so that people really do have a choice. You can change the world. Together we can stop this. But we can't just sit back and do nothing anymore. I don't think that's an option, at least not a God-pleasing option. You know, in all the wars our country has uh, been a part of since its founding 200-plus years ago, over a million men and women have died defending our country. And that's tragic. But what's even more tragic is that 61 million lives have been lost through abortion in our country in the last 47 years and most people are content to just let that keep going on and on. And I just hear the voice of God saying, every time another little one is destroyed through abortion, I just hear God saying to his church, don't just stand there. 
do something. You're the ones I've appointed for this task. You're the ones I've sent for this task. Uh, there are no other provisions. There's just you. You must do something. It's my prayer that all of us will hear God's urgent cry to us and then get busy. Busy living that higher calling of life. Get busy loving like Jesus Christ loves. Get busy speaking up on behalf of the unborn. Get busy loving other people and being there for them when they need us. May the love we show, the love of Christ we show, truly change our world. In Christ's name, amen.